everyone. Whew, powerful, right? Um, so I, I think you enjoyed the film as much as I have. Um, so thanks again. Um, I feel like this panel doesn't need an introduction, but I have to do it. <laughs> um, so let me try. Um, I'd love to introduce uh, author and nutritionist Marion Nessel, the Paula Goddard Professor of Nutrition Food <laughs> Studies and Public Health Emerita at New York University. <laughs> Next, we have author and journalist Michael Pollan. <laughs> and, and I'm so excited that we have Robert Kenner and Melissa Robledo, who are the filmmakers behind Food Inc. too. So big round of applause for them. <laughs> Sadly, our friend Eric Schlosser, who is, uh, was such a big part of the film, uh, is not joining us tonight because he had a family emergency. So keep him and your, his family in your thoughts, everyone. Um, so I want to thank you all for being here. This was incredible. It's been an incredible day. And this is such a wonderful way to top it off. Um, and so I, I, I'm only going to ask a few questions because I want all of you in the audience to participate as much as possible and, and, and ask, the, ask everyone on the stage as, as many questions as you can. But I, I do want to start with Melissa and, and Robbie. So it's been 15 years since Food Inc. first touched audiences mm -hmm. around the world. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can share with us why you decided to make a sequel. Why was now the right time? We thought we would never make a sequel. <laughs> uh, we swore to each other that <laughs> this, this was something that would never happen. We had no interest. And then the pandemic happened. And we looked around and just saw, you know, uh, food being dumped, as you saw in the film, and empty supermarket shelves, and the sort of the insanity, and the workers being so abused in the food plants, and th the dangers of the consolidated food system became so clear. Um, they really crystallized during the COVID crisis, and the dangers of this consolidated system not being able to stand shocks yeah. became really clear. And this is just one of the many shocks. Obviously, climate change is a much bigger shock that's coming. So all of a sudden, it started to seem like this becomes an interesting topic again. And Michael and Marion and Melissa and I decided, and Eric, that maybe this was the right time. Melissa, was it a hard sell for you? Um, no, <laughs> it was not. Also, Michael and Eric both wrote articles about this, and we were, uh, Robbie and I were trying to make, with Mark Weiss, who's here tonight, we were making short films uh, for the New York Times about essential workers at that time, and not able really to express the bigger picture that Eric and Michael brought to this topic, and it felt like the time to revisit. There, there was a really weird serendipity that Eric and I, who had not been in touch recently, both published articles right. on what the pandemic was revealing about the food system on the same day. <laughs> he, me in the New York Review of Books, him in the Atlantic, he focusing on workers and social justice, me focusing, focusing on concentration and why, why farmers were throwing out food. And that was kind of a signal to us, too, that there was something here. Definitely there was something there. Marion, I do want to turn to you because you, you appeared in both films, Food Inc., the, the original. No. You weren't? No. But her fingerprints are all over. Her fingerprints <laughs> are all over, so forget I said that. Sorry. But I, I'm wondering what stands out for you as the biggest changes from, from that first movie to this one. Well, this one's about the politics <laughs> in a way that the, um, the first one was about the system, but this one's about the politics in a pretty serious way, it seems to me, and much more you know, sort of flat out clear, um, clearly stated, uh, very well organized, absolutely powerful, it seems to me. The messages come across. They couldn't be more clear or cogent. Wow. No. That's Thank how you. I think it. 
I want everybody to see this, so make my work much easier. <laughs> <laughs> but when we first spoke about this film in particular, you mentioned ultra-processed foods not being in the first one, and how important that is now, and, right. and what a significant change that has been over the last... Yeah, well, ultra-processed foods is a new concept. 2009 was when uh, Carlos Motero invented it, and... Um, you know, he, he just sent me a slide because of the number of scientific articles using with the word ultra-processed in the title. Has, it's this absolutely astounding, um, I don't know, it's just the most amazing thing. There's yeah, 1,600 yeah. articles so far that have the word ultra-processed. They all show the same thing, that people who eat a lot of ultra-processed foods um, have more chronic disease. They're heavier, they have more diabetes, type 2 diabetes. There's just been one that comes out that says emotional problems, depression, and other kinds of things like that, uh, and mortality, and COVID-19. Yeah, that's course. a big deal, that's a big it's, change. It's, yeah, it's a mean, huge it's, it's change. It's a new direction in nutrition research. Um, the other thing that's new, and, and, and more hopeful than the rise of ultra-processed food, is uh, the presence of John Tester and Cory Booker, mm -hmm. that the food movement, you know, in 2008 did not have a lot of powerful allies. Uh, maybe a couple people in the House. I don't know that there was a big name in the Senate sure. who was willing to identify with these issues. But with, with Cory Booker and John Tester, they're powerful allies. Uh, you know, one with presidential ambitions, uh, Cory Booker, mm -hmm. and, and one, by the way, fighting a very hard reelection uh, mm -hmm. I mean, he really needs our support, John Tester. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Michael, I'm interested in hearing from you. You know, one thing that I, I have talked a lot about personally is this rise of the citizen eater. And, and Marion also talks about this. Do you think that that, you know, since, since the first film, we're seeing more people sort of vote with their food values? Yeah, I mean, I think that was one of the, th that was one of the achievements of the food movement that, you know, that I date to, you know, the early 2000s. Marion's book, uh, Food Politics, mm -hmm. uh, Eric's, Eric's book, book. Uh, Fast Food Nation, and then Omnivore's Dilemma, then this film, and a lot was going on, you know, that, uh, in, the, in the society that was uh, pushing in the same direction. And this idea that the, the consumer could be a citizen in his or her choices, and that voting for your fork, a phrase that Marion used a lot, <laughs> I used a lot, um, I think I, I learned it from Marianne, um, was going to be a powerful thing. Yeah. But I have to say, you know, I've since come to think that there, that was somewhat naive. I sure. mean, that it was, it was ne it's necessary but not sufficient. And that unless we engage with the political system, we're not going to see real change. And so, mm -hmm. so I think we've all gotten a little more sophisticated about that. For um, sure. And, uh, and that it's, uh, it's a harder project than we thought. I mean, that we're up against a much tougher adversary than we thought. Um, Run for office. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that change will really come from the political system. One of the things that I find inspiring about this film that maybe didn't show up in the first film is the momentum we're seeing around you know, uh, food and farm workers. So the, the Amokali workers are, are highlighted and they've made such incredible strides over the last two decades, for sure. But now we're seeing Starbucks workers, Chipotle workers, uh, a lot of different kinds of food workers unite and, and come together. And so I wonder, did you all expect that to happen? And it, was it surprising to you? Well, we, uh, it was interesting in talking about the Amokali workers who we had discussed putting in the first film but then ended up uh, telling the story of the Smithfield workers, and it didn't feel like there was space for two worker stories in the first one, and uh, as big as that. Uh, but somehow with the Immokalee story, this time we were thinking, this could be a good news story, not just a bad news story, and that was kind of a change. And uh, I think, you know, for me, the biggest change between Food Inc. 1 and Food Inc. 2 is that we are a lot more sort of obvious in saying it's a system that needs yeah. to change. And, you know, we 
going around with Food Inc. One at one point, someone in the audience said, "Don't you get it? It's really about capitalism." Mm. And I said, "Yeah, but if we did a film about capitalism, no one would come to see it." <laughs> uh, no, now, no, no nobody now would fund it. Yeah. No <laughs> one would fund it. No one, you know, all the way across. And it was very subtle, and you thought people could figure it out for themselves. This time, we're a lot more blatant, and I think people are much more ready. Mm -hmm. And the Starbucks people are, you know, the strikes are happening, sure. and I think there's, you know, to think that the minimum wage has not gone up from 725 uh, since 2009 is a startling fact. And when people hear that, no one really can believe that. And uh, so it was time to highlight things that we didn't feel we could in the first one. Well, I think it's one of the things the pandemic did. Well, in, was that in, in exposing all of that and the absolutely shocking business about Tyson writing the president's yeah. executive order, which was on the front page of the New York Times. So lots and lots of people saw it and understood it. Um, and the, the business with the infant formula. And, you know, each of those things that you talked about, and I think you highlighted some of the, the main ones, people get it. You know, and I, I'm fond of saying five years ago I couldn't use the word capitalism in a lecture without turning people off completely. And now if I don't use it, somebody in the audience <laughs> says, but aren't you talking about capitalism? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> if I can, can switch gears for a minute, I think that what Fooding did, the, the first film, was start sort of a trend of, of really interesting food films um, that are now on streaming services. Some of them, though, um, and this bothers me, and I think bothers many of us, is that they're inaccurate often. And they're, they're sort of sacrificing accuracy and, and correct facts for people to get you know, people to watch them and make it sort of sensational. And so I'm wondering how you all tried to, you know, your, your they're your competition, these other food films now. How do you sort of balance that, you know, making it entertaining, but keeping the facts in there in a, in a, a really straightforward way that people can understand? Melissa was responsible for that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a challenge. Yeah. It's really, you know, you have to find a way to balance information and stories that move people. And um, it's a constant back and forth and um, the fact-checking process is intense. And I would get calls from Melissa saying, we have to reshoot that thing <laughs> said. And I'm like, oh, it sounded so good. But it wasn't true. <laughs> that it was true of every character. Yeah. <laughs> Sacrifices were made. Yeah. Uh, another thing that changed since uh, the first food, uh, Food Inc. is sort of this rise of, of interest in more plant-based, plant-forward diets. And Michael, I, I love your face when you're talking to Pat Brown. <laughs> Wood pulp. <laughs> Wood. Wood pulp. But, you know, there is, you know, whether we're talking about these ultra-processed plant-based foods or we're talking about sort of the other alternatives that, that are out there, it is sort of a sea change in how people have accepted that, you know, there are vegan, vegetarian foods that are for a, a wider audience. That's a big change. Yeah, that's a big marketplace change. I mean, in general, I think I said this in the film, but um, food was processed in the last couple decades to, for novelty and, you know, make people crave it and all these, you know, not socially beneficial reasons. And now whatever you think of plant-based food, and some of it, I think, kind of jumps the shark. <laughs> Um, it's, the it's, being, <laughs> <laughs> it's being done for very good reasons um, to shrink the meat supply, uh, the meat industry. And, um, you know, I mean, I have, I have ambivalence about it because the phrase plant-based now has an aura of health. It yeah. doesn't always apply. There are lots of unhealthy things that are plant-based. Sugar is a plant. <laughs> um, uh, but... There's also a lot of really encouraging work being yeah. done, and that food science is being applied in a much more uh, socially beneficial way. Absolutely. And that's, I think that's good news on the whole. Yeah, it's really exciting. It, it was really tricky in the film to take on a subject where we were going to be so ambivalent. Uh, that's not a typical way of dealing in a film. 
And uh, I think, Michael, you encouraged us to go ahead, but then started to have second <laughs> thoughts <laughs> later on. Well, I was. I, I really, I mean, the Impossible Burger, I have really mixed feelings sure. about. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I buy and eat them occasionally, and, um, but it is an ultra-processed food. And so, you know, I mean, I think that's testament to the filmmakers that they were willing to go somewhere where it was ambiguous and, and we felt yeah. ambivalent. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, Courtney, who supplied uh, some of those delicious uh, treats uh, that we the just had. The burgers <laughs> and uh, yeah. Yeah. crab uh, cakes. Called the Impossible Burger a gateway food. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a good description. So. <laughs> Melissa and Robbie, I talk to young people a lot who are, are looking for different ways of storytelling, and film is definitely a good vehicle when we're talking about food. Do you have advice? for folks in the audience who are trying to, to figure out how to tell these stories. Maybe it's not a, you know, a feature length film, it's on TikTok or Instagram. <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, well, I, I, I think finding a good story with emotion is um, a great way to start. Yeah. Um, and, and character. You and guys, characters. You guys did yeah. a really good job of finding character. Like Zach Smith, is, a, I think, is a wonderful yeah. character. Yeah. And Brent Smith, the two Smiths. The, the Smith. Smith we only go for Smiths. <laughs> now, if you can move people uh, and at the same time get them the information, so you have to make it relatable. And this is a, a little more hardcore than the first one. The first one had, had more characters sure. in a way and mm. sort of wonder. But this, we were trying to tell a story that was harder to do through characters in the same way. But... Ideally, if anyone out there in the audience try to go with characters and stories, and it's it much it, it, people get moved by emotion much more than information. And other people, yeah, definitely. Um, before we turn to the audience, one final question. I'd love to know what your call to action is for the people who saw the film tonight and the millions of others who will eventually see it. What is your biggest call to action? And this is for all of you, whoever wants to chime in. Marion, I'll pick on you. <laughs> Call to action. You got to become a food activist and um, or a food advocate if you prefer that term, which I actually do. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the I, I, I was I went to the climate summit this afternoon uh, during this day be, that was here before this, and the last panel uh, was a panel of, of I think five or six people who identified as Generation Z, and. <laughs> It, and they were talking about what it was like to be their age and look at the world the way it is now and try to get people active in trying to change it and make it better. They've been left a very, very tough world to deal with. And they talked about how discouraged so many of their friends and colleagues are about their ability to change anything. They feel hopeless that they can do anything. And this is very painful for me to listen to because I came of age during the 1960s when we thought, naively as it may have been, that we were going to change the world for the better. We were absolutely convinced of it, and in some ways we did. You know, the women's movement, the civil rights movement, the environmental movement all came out of that era. But they've never had that experience. They've never had the experience of being able to change something for the better and see the kind of good that they can do. So that requires organizing. I tell everybody to read the book, Organizing for Social Change. It's a blueprint for how to go about doing that. You want goals. This film has a whole series of goals in the in the credits, and I'm I now in you know the lectures that I'm giving. My last slide has a a rainbow on it um, <laughs> with a list of goals: um, campaign finance reform, changing the agricultural system so it focuses on food, not fuel and automobiles because that's what it currently does. Um, universal basic income, a healthcare system that works. I mean, these are all things that are worth working on. Um, and ridiculous as it may seem to think that you can change these things, if you don't know that that's what your goal is, then you don't know what you're working on now. 
The things that you're working on now should be steps to those goals, if you know what they are. And so I want to encourage everybody to do that. Uh, because there's lots to do. And I thought one of the things that this film did was to show individuals who are making real change and meaningful change. Absolutely. Michael. Yeah, I, I, I agree with everything Marion said, as I always do. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but I think, you know, the Farm Bill, I mean, I've been talking about this for 15 years, is a really important piece of legislation that people who live in cities don't pay any attention to it all. Mm -hmm. And we've kind of given it away to the big ag states. And the fact that Cory Booker is on the ag committee, an urban legislator, that hasn't happened since the 60s when food stamps were getting started. Yeah. Um, and it's, that's right. And it's really important who's on, the, on those committees, um, the ag committee in particular. Um, and that we get involved with that issue. It comes around every five years. It's, it, it's the rules of the game by which the whole food system plays. And it is the reason that ultra-processed food is more economical than real food. I mean, it all traces back to that piece of legislation and the incentives built, built into it. Yeah. So I think as a focus of work, it's, it's key. Um, and, and building up the, the kind of people in Washington who share these values uh, letting them know they'll be rewarded for working on that issue. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it really, and, and all, the other thing I would counsel is patience. Um, mm. You know, when I started on this issue, I, I didn't think it was going to take this long <laughs> to make significant <laughs> progress, but it's clearly a generation long struggle. And we have to realize that and that victories are going to be incremental. Sure. Um, but it's also an issue that offers an unusual amount of hope. Um, more, I think, than the climate issue in many ways, um, because people can do something in their own lives and the, with their own decisions. They can see results in the yeah. marketplace, at least. Um, and that it addresses other issues. It's, you know, it's food, as you learn today, is key to climate. Food is also key to health, you know, and we have a climate crisis and we have a health crisis. We could address them both because what what will help with one will help with the other. Absolutely. Um, so that it's, it's an issue that can be leveraged to help with these other very important issues. Yeah, that's a very hopeful message to, to share with everyone. I, I do want to turn to questions from the audience. There are roving mics. I want to ask that you keep your questions short and make them actually questions so that as many people <laughs> as possible have a chance to ask them. So we all, you know, are here for different reasons, but I, I just want to make sure that you're asking actual questions. There's straight in front of me. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. I'm Anna Millet with Slow Food. It's nice to see all of you. I was really happy to see the segment on fish and sustainable fish and kelp farming. Um, I wish it was a little longer. And I wonder, of course, <laughs> you have to make choices of, as filmmakers. And I wonder what other things hit the cutting room floor that you wish you could have, and maybe why those things weren't included, if you could talk to them about <laughs> That's that. That's a great question. Wow. Well, uh, she must know Paul. Yeah, Paul, <laughs> Paul Greenberg's here tonight. Uh, He's on the cutting room floor. <laughs> and he was great to interview and talked about fish. And it was a really, uh, it, it was one of the most exciting interviews we had in the film. Uh, the, the challenge was, uh, <laughs> Paul, where are you? Stand up. <laughs> oh, hi, Paul. Uh, <laughs> Yay, Paul. Paul wrote, Paul wrote Four Fish, which is a wonderful book. Um, <laughs> it was just very hard because in the beginning we had these dark stories and it was hard to introduce new characters at the very end uh, that you hadn't met before. So just finding the right balance was hard. So we lost a number of good stories uh, that hit the... The, uh, you know, the cutting room floor, but I'm trying to think who I else. Know, I'm, I'm yeah, they're all painful. It's <laughs> like, as we say, it's like drowning the puppies. You know, you have to go <laughs> in and drown some puppies, but... Um. So you need to make another film then? Yeah. <laughs> no Come pressure, back. no pressure. Okay, I want to, anyone over here, because I feel like I've ignored this side all day, right there. Not, 
not Jordan. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Really fantastic film. My name is Skylar Ross. I'm a lawyer at Bulmer Hale. I was wondering if you could comment on the relationship between the political ideas in the film and the fact that most Americans just don't cook, either for lack of knowledge, time, money, or another resource. Nice question. Well, cooking is, uh, you know, I think a very important part of the solution to so many of our problems, but it is a, it's a, it's a hurdle for a lot of people. Um, one of the encouraging things of the pandemic is people did start cooking more. Uh, they bought more cookbooks, they bought more kitchen equipment, and I don't know how many people kept the habit alive, but there is no better way to assure the quality of your food or the healthfulness than to cook it yourself. You're not, you're not at the victim of those long ingredient lists. You know, Carlos Montero defines uh, ultra-processed food in a very elegant way, I think. It, it's, it's made with foods, you, with ingredients you don't have at home and, uh, and machinery you don't have at home. Um, and that tells you all you need to know, um, that, you know, real food follows naturally if you're cooking. Um, to make it possible, that woman who worked at Taco Bell, I, I'm guessing she doesn't have time to cook. I mean, because people are working two jobs very often or really long hours. Also, the other thing that gets in the way of cooking are really long commutes. People are, at least, I mean, not as much now as before the pandemic, but people, uh, you know, are burning up hours at the beginning and end of the day also. Um, so I continue to think it's a really important thing to do. I think we've somewhat mystified the complexity of cooking because of our culture of, you know, our chef culture. It seems harder to people than it actually is and more time consuming than it actually is. Um, but yeah, I think it's a very important part of the solution. Back there. Hello? Oh, yes. Hi, I have a question about I, the, the ambivalence about the processed meat, the ultra processed sort of fake meat. How then? Do you, the d demand for meat is projected to, is just going to go up and up and up and up. And the impossible people and the Beyond Burger, they want to get the meat, they want to convert the meat eaters. And yet, there's the ambivalence, right? Like there's so much stuff that goes into these burgers. But does that make it kind of more okay because it's better for the climate than, you know, feeding? Seven, creating, tearing down more rainforests for more cows, et cetera? I, it is better for the climate. I mean, I think you can make that case, although an uh, old-fashioned veggie burger is even better for the climate right. because the Impossible Burger is built on that uh, soy monoculture, right? It, it, it's, it's built on commodity agriculture, the same old, same old, um, whereas a, a, you know, a homemade veggie burger or even a commercial veggie burger has got legumes in it, and it's, it's, if you look at the ingredients, it's lots of different plants. So that's even better for the environment. Um, you know, Pat Brown says at one point that you can't change people's habits. It's just a given that people are going to eat huge amounts of meat. I don't know. I, I, I would challenge that idea. I mean, people do change their habits. Um, I can imagine a time where eating meat is, uh, you know, there's a stigma around eating meat, as there is a stigma now about smoking or a stigma about throwing stuff out of your car, littering. Um, I think it's worth working on trying to change habits. The more people understand that one of their biggest contributors to climate change is, is their meat-eating habit, and that is something very concrete they can do to reduce. And there are other ways to think about meat that don't involve um, giving it up, you know, using it more as a flavor principle in your cooking rather than as the centerpiece, you know, the big chunk of animal protein. That's a really new Anglo-American idea. Most cultures never ate meat that way. And we changed, uh, smoking was a great example where basically raising the price, the taxes on those cigarettes. And right now we are subsidizing this meat to make it so cheap. If we were paying the real cost of that meat. Which we, that's another thing that didn't make it into the film because we couldn't really calculate it. We were trying to like, what is the real cost of a hamburger? If you, if you take all the externalities, what it's doing to the environment, what it's doing to the animals, what it's doing to the workers, you know, that 99 cent or $2 burger is probably like a couple hundred dollars. Um, but, and, and the waste, of course, in the feedlots. So that if we, 
if we paid the true cost of meat, we would automatically be eating less of it. Thank you. Right here. Hi, I'm great. Yeah, I'm Rebecca Shaw. I'm the chief scientist for WWF. And I read a really interesting book by Chris Van uh, Telecken from the University mm -hmm. College of London called Ultra Processed, Processed People, People, The Science of Food That's Not Food, this mm -hmm. last spring. And I was really struck by uh, his, the role he um, advanced in empathy, empathy for the people who are overweight, suffering from diabetes and obesity and can't stop it, uh, the producers who are caught in a system producing food that they know is unhealthy for, for themselves, for their land, for people, and also for the retailers that are pumping out food, but they have to do it because their shareholders demand uh, an increasing margin. And I just wonder, what is the role of empathy in the transition that we know needs to happen? Mm. That's I'll, a lovely question. It's a, it's a lovely question. I think we need empathy for everybody who's involved in this. Um, you know, a great deal of empathy because we're, th this is a system problem. That's one of the things that's really new, it seems to me. I, I mean, I think there are three things in nutrition that are new and revolutionary. One is food systems thinking. Um, one is ultra-processed food, and the other is what are called triple-duty diets, which are eating diets that will simultaneously address chronic disease, address hunger, and address climate change. Uh, these are new ways of thinking that I think have really changed nutrition in, a, in an enormous way. And in every piece of that, the if you're trying to do a systems change, that's a really big deal. And we're talking about capitalism again. I mean, there it is. This is the system that, that these things are in. And to change them means disruption, which is always hard on some people, usually the poor, um, and, uh, and not on others. And if we change this in the direction in which we all think, it should go in protecting climate change and protecting health. It's going to put people who are currently on top um, in positions where they need some sympathy. Um, but it's hard to bring that up when, where's your sympathy for the people who have been suffering for, from all of the current problems? And there are many more of those. So that's where my empathy is currently going. So. I thought it was a, I thought one of the more interesting things to come out of the pandemic was the concept of the essential worker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, right. We all, this was on everybody's lips, mm -hmm. and these are, of course, as Eric points out in the film, the least paid people. Mm -hmm. We don't treat them as essential in any way, uh, and as the farm worker said, we treat them as disposable. And, you know, I would hope that the film increases both the empathy and appreciation of these people who, you know, work brutal jobs to feed us. And, um, and I'm hoping that's something people will take from this film. Thank you. I'm gonna try to spread the love a little bit. Jordan, I'm gonna give it to you. <laughs> I'm Jordan Thomas, I'm a climate change anthropologist. And Marion, I really liked your story about how your students kind of called you out for talking about capitalism without talking about capitalism. <laughs> And it kind of strikes me that capitalism is obviously this very important thing, right? But it's something that people very s rarely slow down to actually define. So I'm curious how you all, making this film, think about capitalism. Should we be talking about capitalisms, like plural, as many possibilities for the system? And if we are thinking about alternative systems, are there ways to do so without triggering people or framing it as a binary choice? Can I, can I get with that? Yeah. All of you. <laughs> get in there, everyone, get in there. <laughs> Marion goes first. <laughs> Thank you. One, one of the things on my list of rainbow um, ideas is to change the way that Wall Street evaluates corporations. Um, the current system means that, and, and this 
on, and by the way, this system only started in 1981. You can date it to 1981 when the shareholder value movement got kicked off by Jack Welch, who was the head of General Electric, and everybody bought into it. I want to see Wall Street change so that it's it requires corporations to have real social responsibility as part of uh, Wall Street's evaluation of it instead of just how much money the company is making. That would make a huge difference. It doesn't mean that corporations don't make a profit. They still make a profit. They just don't have to be quite so greedy. <laughs> they don't have to grow their profit every 90 days. If you just think about it, growth is impossible in the food system every 90 days because we already have 4,000 calories in the food supply. It can't keep going up and up and up because people can't eat that much even if they're putting on huge amounts of weight. So we need to do something about the way the system is operated from this country, and it's only been 40 years. We could go back or develop something that worked even better, requiring corporations to do real social responsibility. It would make a huge difference. Their profits would be lower, but they wouldn't be that much lower. Uh, uh, Robert Reich was asked, uh, he was complaining about the system we have today, and someone said, well, if, this, if you don't like this system, what would you prefer? And he said, I think the greatest system was the one we had in the United States in the 1950s and 60s, where people, you know, you, you had to pay the cost for dumping your garbage in the street. And today, these companies don't have to pay the cost for dumping their garbage, and you know, I think that's something that needs to happen. Um, and then they'll get the profits that they can get, if you know, and they'll have to figure out how to clean up their own garbage. The other thing that that is pointed out in the film that's really relevant to this is if you take a historical perspective, as Marion just did, and Eric does. We, the rules of the road of capitalism have changed a lot. Um, mm -hmm. We used to have antitrust enforcement. And we used to have much less concentration and much more competition. That was more true to the, to the ethos and theory of capitalism than what we have now. We have market failure now. And um, so I think that you don't have to argue for overthrowing capitalism. I think you just have to work on the, the rules. And that's always been the job of the political system, is to create the rules of the road for capitalism. And we've just, you know, that's why, um, uh, campaign finance reform is so important because uh, the government has been captured by, by large corporations. Thank you. Over here, sort of behind the whole. Yes, you, you. Oh, sure. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Dina from Bloomberg, and I was really struck by the opening of the film. The pandemic really exposed the problems in our food system to all Americans um, in ways that so many of us have been watching for so long. And we saw the, the shortages at the supermarket, the outbreaks at the slaughter plants, the dumping of massive quantities of food. It felt like there was maybe this moment where people were really paying attention and something was really going to change. Mm -hmm. Is there any reason to think that that moment didn't pass, that something is going to change? What, what's, the, uh, what's the light that I'm, I'm not seeing? I feel like that moment certainly hasn't passed in terms of labor. I think that, as we were saying, there's just such an uprising of um, workers demanding better working conditions. And um, it, it for sure felt like something to me that was signaled during the pandemic and that the entire country had a moment to recognize the plight of workers. And I feel like that moment is ongoing. And I think consolidation is another aspect that people are much more concerned about today than they were prior to the pandemic. Yeah, we haven't heard a lot about it, but um, President Biden put in place a very strong team on antitrust both at the FTC and the Justice Department. They've just started to make moves, um, and we'll see if they can come through. But they are, th they, these are people who are 
bent on overturning the change in antitrust policy that was alluded to in the film in 1980 when under Reagan uh, the, the rules were changed so that uh, concentrate, uh, mergers were permitted as long as consumers didn't suffer price increases, even though the point of antitrust is to protect producers as well as consumers and protect the political system against concentrations of power. So, you know, I, I'm skeptical how far they'll get with this, but th I think that I would watch that. I, I think that's really important and, and could be very encouraging. And if, should there be a second Biden term, um, I think we might see a lot of action in that area. Marion, any thoughts? Um, I'm, I think some of the gain, some of the gains that I was very impressed that the Times yesterday had this um, thing about child poverty, where there was an enormous decrease in child poverty. It went down to five percent, which is the lowest it's been practically in history. And then in one year, it went from five percent to twelve percent because the policies that were established during the pandemic were removed by Congress, um, even though they didn't even cost that much. You know, the the polarization of the political system right now is making things very difficult. But there's some stuff going on. And the question is how to keep the momentum going in that direction and how to support the people who are pushing in that direction. Uh, and you have, to keep, you have to keep working on it. Because if you don't, then when, when the, when the zeitgeist changes, um, then you're not ready. You have to be ready for a change. And maybe there'll be one. Maybe it'll be a good one. And you also, I think it's very important to appreciate the ferocity of the adversaries. <laughs> and that is one of the legacies of the first Food Inc., um, a, a sorry legacy, which was there was much less opposition to the values of the food movement before Food Inc. I mean, I felt it in my own uh, work. After that movie came out, you know, books, nobody really pays that much attention. Um, <laughs> but mo a movie that was successful, and that's when the Farm Bureau organized campaigns, uh, started visiting op-ed editors, right. asking for equal time, because they were, they were getting very negative coverage in the mainstream press, and they succeeded yeah. in getting lots of Pro agribusiness uh, copy into the paper, um, various campaigns to silence voices on campus that were talking about reform. I had a series of of uh, public appearances at ag schools, and I love going to talk at ag schools because you're reaching the next generation of farmers. And over the course of 2009 and 10, these these dates got canceled under very sure. suspicious circumstances or there would be counter-programming to make sure that nobody came to my talks. Um, so the, the, the industry work. is, it didn't work. <laughs> the industry is, is, has, realizes the stakes of this fight and they are organized and they are fighting. And, and we just have to understand that we have um, opposition. We actually saw this last week about ultra-processed foods where an entire set of industries testified at the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee against doing anything about ultra-processed foods. It's not defined properly. If you avoid ultra-processed foods, you won't get the nutrients you need. Um, there are a whole series of arguments that have been out there because the Dietary Guidelines are actually considering saying something about ultra-processed foods, we will see, <laughs> because... Yeah. We have seen. Hmm? We have seen. You've seen it. <laughs> the advisory committee actually doesn't write the guidelines, so it's the, it's the government agencies that do. So, so I'm not optimistic, but it, there it was, public, publicly, public uh, discussion of a concept, just absolutely trashing it. Um, and there's and there have been many many articles written about what's wrong with the ultra processed food concept. Absolutely, I, we have time for one more question. You've had your hand. I'm sorry. Hello. Yeah. Well, sure. Yeah. <laughs> You've had your hand up for quite a while. Hi. Okay. Good. Yeah, that sounds good. Hi, Ur Urvashi Rangan. I'm the chief scientist with Grace. 
Communications Foundation and um, big fan, great movie. I wanted to ask about two issues that I didn't see in the movie and maybe why they're not in there. But the first one is about the intellectual property behind ultra processed foods um, and the fact that this is a figment of Silicon Valley's imagination and <laughs> it is um, pushing things that are not viable at this point as your film well pointed out um, and also includes the use of antibiotics and chemicals and things that you're not gonna find on the ingredient label. I loved your ingredient label roll ups but there's so much more used in ultra processed foods that may also be contributing to the problem. So I'm curious about that. And I'm curious about, because there was so much good talk about the pandemic and the relationship to food. Um, it isn't just about nutrition, of course. Confinement is at the root of virulence and antibiotic resistance. And the reason, at least in my mind as a toxicologist, that we saw COVID happen is because of these intensive animal systems where you can get genetic jumping and you can create the resistance and the virulence because that's what they want. That's what the bacteria want. Shove me together and I will resist you. Um, so I'm curious about those two points um, in terms of whether you considered them um, and if so, maybe why they're not in there. Well, we we definitely uh, looked at the issue of confinement. We talked with Dr. Osterholm a couple of times um, about uh, there were statistics of, that there are about the number of birds on the planet, right? Like it, it was insane. Uh, and the proximity of flight patterns over, uh, there was a lot, I, I think the answer is that there's so much that could go into the film and um, this is, somebody was asking what didn't make it. This is one that didn't. Sure. Um, in terms of AI, uh, uh, in terms of IP and somebody, I don't, I can't really speak to that one. Well, we, we, hint, we hint at it in that uh, talking about how Silicon Valley thinks this is the next big thing that's mentioned in the film. But there's just, you're always, anytime you make a film, you're not going to be able to get everything in it. And, those are two really interesting subjects that just didn't fit. I think Silicon Valley's been hoodwinked by people with food startups into thinking this is like tech, yeah. and it's not. I mean, the IP is, it's very hard to get IP in food. I remember writing about General Mills and cereal tech, I went to the Institute for Cereal Technology <laughs> where they invent new cereals, and they said, yeah, you can't patent a Cheerio or any given shape so what you do is you make the machine that makes it and then you keep it under lock and key so no one else can see how you're doing it. <laughs> so I think that Silicon Valley is going to be very disappointed by their food investments and they will get out of it in the same way they, they got into and out of ethanol around 2008. The um, stocks are already declining yeah. Yeah. in a lot of them. Yeah, thank you for all of the questions. Thank you for your lively participation. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, have, I have an announcement. Stay where you are. We have a few announcements. One, I want to give a shout out to the, the companion book for the film, Fooding 2, Inside the Quest for a Better Food Future. Stay seated, everyone. Um, it's published, edited, uh, uh, published and edited by Carl Weber and Clive Priddle. Um, Michael has a chapter in it. And Danny has a chapter Thank in you. it. Thank um, you. And <laughs> you can learn more about the book at, uh, I'm sorry, you can learn more about the book and the film at foodinc2.com and join the movement by signing up for uh, Fooding 2, the, the community to support the campaign around the film. If you go out into the lobby, um, you'll, you can link leave your thoughts. Uh, there's a, a board, you can leave some questions and thoughts, and there will be a survey if you use your phone to um, uh, scan a QR code. So please, please consider that. Um, we're now going to enjoy another lovely reception. I want to thank again everyone who has made tonight possible, including WNYC, NPR, participant, River Road, and NYU Steinhardt. Round of applause, please. <laughs> I want to thank the Food Tank team and all of the volunteers who have made today really go smoothly. So a huge thanks to all of them. And award-winning uh, singer, songwriter, Amber Rubarth is now going to entertain us with some lovely music, including her song, Cover Crop. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you.